you've heard interest rate cuts are on the horizon and you're just burning at the inside for some relief in homeowner affordability. But let's pause for a second and consider. In today's economic climate, can these cuts truly make homes more accessible for the average Canadian? What if I told you that even with the Bank of Canada cutting rates, your chances of witnessing the housing market make a proper comeback are slimmer than you think. If you ask the average Canadian what they believe is needed to allow them to afford a home, you'll get one of two responses, lower interest rates or build more homes. Building more homes could help, but it's a slow solution in a fast growing country like ours. Most of us really won't see the benefits for a decade or two. Because of this, most people turn to interest rates as the short-term solution to housing affordability. Homeowners are looking for interest rate cuts to bring more buyers into the market and increase the value of their homes. Potential buyers, on the other hand, are looking for interest rate cuts to allow them to enter the housing market. However, the outlook really isn't as straightforward as you may think. Here are five critical reasons to consider. First up, the issue of homeowner affordability. It's no secret that the dream of home ownership has become increasingly elusive for many Canadians. It seems to be all that anyone can talk about, with home prices reaching astronomical levels and interest rates squeezing budgets, the affordability ratio is 50% more stretched than historical norms. This ratio is measured as the share of income a household would need to cover ownership costs. If we look at that chart created by RBC, you can see that Canada as a whole is at 62.5% for the aggregate of all home types, meaning to own the average Canadian home it would cost the average Canadian 62.5% of their income. You can also see Vancouver there, which is at 102%. Then we have Toronto at 84% for the aggregate. For condos in Toronto, the affordability ratio is at 48%. Single family detached homes, on the other hand, are at a whopping 102.6%. For context, the median household income in Toronto was $84,000 in 2021, meaning to own the average detached home in Toronto, it would cost $86,000 a year. And for a condo, it would cost $40,320. For the province, that means 21.7% of people can afford a detached home and 44% can afford a condo, meaning 55.6% of people, the majority, can't afford a condo in Ontario. So just think about those numbers for a moment. The average home in Toronto, accounting for all home types, takes up 84% of the average Torontonian's income. The historical average is 49.9%. We are at a record high of homeownership unaffordability, and it hasn't been this bad since interest rates were at 14% in 1982. To bring affordability back to the average for Canada, we'd need either a 30% increase in personal incomes, 62% for Toronto incomes, or a 20% drop in home prices, and that would be 40.5% drop for Toronto home prices. Neither scenario seems likely in the near term, especially with the current unemployment rates. This level of affordability stress is a stark reminder of the challenges that are facing potential buyers in today's environment. Now, the second hurdle, getting a loan. It's not just about how much it costs, but it's about whether you can get one at all. Canadian banks are becoming much more cautious, pulling back on who they give credit to and how much. This tightening is mainly because of the increase in the number of residential mortgages that are in default, along with the tougher economic conditions. As a bank, you do not want to be lending money during high interest rate and slow economic growth periods because the risk of the borrower not being able to make their payments is increased drastically. This past year alone, defaults are up 11%. Borrowers who can't pay their loans are what lead to things like the financial crisis. So banks have to be very careful as to not repeat history. This tightening of credit conditions can be seen in the mortgage lending stats. From 2021 to 2022, mortgage lending had increased by 8%. From 2022 to 2023, mortgage lending had only increased by 3.4%, the lowest increase in mortgage lending since 2001. This lack of credit availability applies to everyone, not just the average person. The wealthiest even have to hear the bank say no during these times, and it creates a stagnant housing environment as we are seeing today. Interest rates would really have to fall quite drastically. We're talking into the low 3% range for a five-year fixed mortgage 
in order to see banks get back to their previous willy-nilly lending habits. The third reason is the massive amount of debt Canadians are in. With a near record household debt to income ratio of 179.5%, the record being 184.5% in Q3 of 2022. Canadian families are under immense financial strain. You may be thinking, well, everyone all over the world is in debt. It's kind of the new normal. That is correct in a way. You see, our neighbors down south in the country of debt, the United States of America, had their debt to income ratio peak at 137.9%, right as the credit bubble burst in 2007. They're now sitting at a 93% debt to income ratio in the US. 86% lower than here in Canada. This means that if Canadians income is $100,000, they have $179,000 in debt. For an American, they have only $93,000 in debt per every $100,000 they earn. Our household debt to income ratio chart really is terrifying to look at as we've never had our bubble burst like the Americans did. You can see ever since 2008, they've been downtrending in the States. Canada, on the other hand, just doesn't stop increasing. This leaves many Canadians wondering when it will pop and what their financial situation will be when it does. The financial stress this creates is unbearable, and the idea of taking on more debt, even with lower interest rates, is far from appealing. Now, onto the fourth hurdle. We have to talk about the current interest rate environment itself. The average effective interest rate, meaning the average rate people are paying on all their loans, so lines of credit, your mortgage, car loans, student loans, and so on. That average rate on consumer debt in Canada is at a 22 year high, making the debt burden even more challenging to manage. The last time the rate was that high, the debt to income ratio was just below 110%. Today, it's just below 180. The problem with the average effective interest rate being at this high of a level is that even if the rates do come down, it won't really change much on paper financially because there's a very, very long way the interest rates need to go down. If we look at people who would be having uh, five-year fixed mortgages coming up for renewal this year, it would be those who got their loans in 2019. If we look at the five-year fixed rate for the first six months of 2019, it was 5.34%. For the second half of 2019, it was 5.19%. Right now, we're at 6.9%, which means that those people who have their loans coming up because they loaned in 2019, will need to renew at a rate 1.56% higher than what they got in 2019. Meaning that for every $100,000 that is on loan, it will cost them an extra $1,560 in interest. Those who got mortgages when the real estate market was really hot between August of 2020 and April of 2022, because rates were at all time lows, they would have got their five year fixed rate at roughly 4.79% on average. That is 2.11% below today's rate, meaning as their renewals start coming up in the next year or so, 2025, 2026, they will need to pay an extra $2,100 per $100,000 on loan. Interest rates in the past year only changed by half a percent, meaning that they won't really be much different from what they are now come 2025 and 2026. My interpretation of this is that Canadians won't want to be taking on more debt when they have these additional costs in their near future. And that's my fourth reason as to why even if the Bank of Canada cuts rates this year, most Canadians won't be enticed to start all over again with a whole new chunk of debt at a rate that is still higher than what they're used to. The fifth and final reason, Canadians are already full on real estate and their belt just can't hold it in anymore. Canadians have a substantial portion of their wealth tied up in residential real estate. 45% of their total household assets is real estate. The historical norm for all of Canada is 35%. And looking at our friends down south again, real estate makes up only 29% of their total household assets. The record high amount that the US had was 33% in 2005, just before the housing bubble burst in 2008. This overexposure to real estate is a double-edged sword. It provides us with a strong real estate market that can withstand many different economical climates, 
But at the same time, it puts us in situations like we're seeing now, where many people start to lose their homes or get into more debt than they can handle once the cost of borrowing climbs. This fifth and final reason makes the prospect of further investment in the housing market just statistically less likely, regardless of any policy moves by the BOC. I believe we'll just see the usual crowd moving around. People who are already in the housing market selling and moving to either upsize or downsize. The barriers to entry for first time buyers are extremely high and the only first time buyers that are purchasing are those who can look to their family for financial help. This results in very minimal market growth, if any at all, because it's just the same people within the same market, which means no growth. It definitely doesn't provide an environment for a hot housing market like many believe lower interest rates will bring. What are your thoughts? Do you think the housing market here still has some fuel in the tank and it just needs a spark? Or has the housing market balloon stretched to its limits and now it will hover rather than soar? Feel free to discuss directly with me. My contact info is always down in the description below. If you found this analysis helpful, let me know. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more deep dives into the economic trends that matter to you. Thanks for watching.